So to start off, Roger Wilbers going to do femoral neck non-union. All right, so it's my, um, my goal this morning is to talk a little bit about uh, femoral neck non-unions. And uh, the question is when and how, um, and theoretically you're supposed to do this in 10 minutes. So um, there's a really long legacy of hip surgery. And I think that unless you're the, the best hip surgeon in, in the world, best trauma surgeon in the world, you're gonna have to deal with femoral neck non-unions. The reported literature is uh, upwards of 10 to 20% with open induction intrafixation fixation and femoral neck fractures. Uh, so if you're a, you're a trauma surgeon, you're going to have to deal with this. I learned most of what I know about doing intertrochan tire osteotomies from Jeff Mast and Keith Mayo. Uh, but there's a long and storied history for intertrochan tire osteotomies. Uh, they learned most of what they knew from guys like Rene Marti and Maurice Mueller, who learned a lot of what they know from Renato Bombelli and Paul McKay and Friedrich Powell's. So it's a very long, long history to this operation. And honestly, not a lot has, uh, has changed with respect to the techniques and how it's performed over time. Um, and the techniques that I will show you today uh, really have been passed down over a long period of time. So my objectives for you at the end of the session uh, is, uh, should go back, um, is to understand uh, how much correction is appropriate, uh, know who is a candidate and when to perform the surgery, and then to be able to convert your plan into a surgical tactic because Keith and Raul did a really nice job about creating a plan last week, uh, but now it's up to us to be able to translate that. Um, you know, there's a quote in the wall at uh, the Congress Center at Davos says, I was never such an expert when I started, as when I started on a, a topic. Uh, if you wanna feel humbled, go back to the old textbooks and I really suggest you do this, Paul McKay and and uh, Friedrich Powell's and just look at how much time they spent understanding the mechanics of the proximal femur. Um, you know, the basic point is, is that there is both a, a compression and a tension side to the, to the proximal femur based on the fact that we have an angle to the neck. And the idea behind all this is to, is to convert, to remove the tension side of this and convert it all into compression. So historically, uh, Keith mentioned that a lot of this was done with just very simple fixation techniques using tension band wires and that sort of thing. But it did leave a lot of people with rather, you know, rather straight or pencil type of legs. Because um, what they're trying to do is completely eliminate uh, the tension side and go all into compression. So large wedges were actually removed. And typically we were talking about 30 to 35 degree uh, wedges that were taken out. And that would convert the Powell's angle into one that was 20 degrees to 30 degrees. It was all in compression. Uh, a real valuable paper that helped us out a few years ago was this one that came out by Yuan and Bure and Nork. Uh, because a lot of us, what we had been doing was trying to convert things back to more of a normal shaped proximal femur so that we didn't have quite so much deformity. Uh, and these guys presented in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma and looked at 32 patients and said, you know what, if you don't take a huge wedge out, what's the difference? So the smaller wedges look like they healed just as well as the large wedges, the 30 degree wedges. Um, and it wasn't a problem with the healing of either the osteotomy or the healing of the non-union. The one thing that was interesting in their paper is they also noticed that the larger degree wedges seem to have a little bit higher incidence of avascular necrosis associated with that. So that was really encouraging for me because uh, what we had been doing, what I had been doing was trying to restore normal anatomy and it, uh, and it had been successful, and I think this shows that that's the case. The case of when, when do you do this is a, you know, when can mean sort of when in the timeline of a patient's healing, say you have a femoral neck and you're following it along and you're waiting for it to heal and you're not certain if it's healed. I would say most of the time in my career, I've been able to tell whether something's gonna heal or not by about three months. So I'm starting to think at three months, if it doesn't look like it's healed, I'm feeling quite suspicious. If I wanna give them a little bit more time, I will. But one thing that makes your osteotomy much more difficult is hardware failure. Uh, so I don't suggest that you wait for a very long period of time for the screws to start breaking. So then you have to extract all the screws as part of your operation, but try to choose that early. And then the other thing is, is when, when with, with respect to the types of patients, you know, what patients are candidates for this? And I would like to give you just a little bit of a, you know, a history or talk about a patient I saw over 22 years ago. And this is a lady that had 
a femoral neck fracture, but I didn't recognize it at the time. So she had a femoral shaft fracture, plateau, a pilon. Uh, she was really quite hurt and morbidly obese. We put a intramedullary nail in her femur, just treated as usual. And you know, this is one of those cases where I went back to find the x-rays and everything had been destroyed and not digitized, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate. But one of those cases that shows up in your office a month after you operate on them and I put the x-rays up and I learned a real good lesson that day and never put the x-rays up for the first time when you're standing in front of a patient because the femoral neck was 100% displaced and completely off and the head was off. So I ended up going back, uh, doing an open reduction on the femoral neck, pulling the rod out, putting a plate on the femur. She went on to a non-union. She was in her 40s or 50s at the time. This is, a, like I said, 22, 23 years ago now. And I ended up doing a Powell's osteotomy on that, pulled the plate off the femur and did a Powell's osteotomy on her. And this is the most recent x-ray that I've had, and it's not because I lost track of the patient, this was 10 years ago, completely healed the femoral head and neck, but I've been following her ever since and have done you know, total knees on her and everything since then, but this hip has never been a problem for her. So I would suggest to you that, that uh, you don't lose faith, you don't immediately go to total hip replacements on patients. Um, we were very fortunate to know Rene Marti, and we're also very fortunate to have this literature that he published uh, before he passed away. Very, 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 very nice gentleman. Uh, and these were his recommendations basically at the end of the paper. He said, you know, do healthy patients up to 65 years of age with non-unions of femoral neck, they're, they're candidates. Your union rates can be pretty good. They reported 80 to 90%. And I think with, with new techniques, I think it's even better than that if you look at Sean Mark's results. And then they're getting good, good to excellent results on about 62%. So not, not everybody that heals is having a good to excellent result, but overall it's pretty good. They did warn us about a uh, little bone stock inside the femoral head. Now that's a relative term. Every, every patient that has a little bit of windshield wipering, wipering in, in the femoral head from some screws or something like that is not necessarily not a candidate. Those people still can have osteotomies and you can get a very good result. But large cavitary defects, that's a problem. And if you have radiographic signs of avascular necrosis in patients over 30, it's considered a contraindication for an osteotomy. But I'll tell you honestly, I don't look for AVN. I don't get MRIs. I don't get specialized studies. I'm not looking for it. If I have a head that hasn't collapsed, I'm considering most of my young patients a candidate for doing osteotomies. Um, so in the 60 to 85, 65 to 80 year old group, total hip replacement is probably the best overall option. Let me give you some exceptions. There are some exceptions to that rule. And this is a patient I took care of a number of years ago uh, that came to see me because she was really unhappy with the leg length deformity um, discrepancy and the deformity of her proximal femur. And she was 72 years old. And I'll tell you, well, the most important thing in her life was actually yoga. So she, con she convinced me that I, I would do an osteotomy on her based on her activities. She had a shortened leg. You could see that the trochanter was sitting kind of high, so the abductor didn't function very well. So she was either going to have a Duchenne or a Trendelenburg type of gait. You can see that the center of the femoral head and the offset to the anatomic axis of the femur were all real short, which is also going to aggravate the limb. Uh, so these are the things that I wanted to correct. The overall uh, antitorsion of the femoral neck actually looked pretty reasonable. So I went ahead and did an osteotomy on this patient. This one's a little bit different uh, in that I felt I needed to transfer the trochanter as well. So what you're seeing here in the middle portion is a piece of allograft bone that, that I'd utilized. Um, and she went on over time to heal this and do exceedingly well. She was one of the happiest patients I ever had. And she was able to go back to her yoga, which was one of the most important things. So I wouldn't say that Everybody over age 85 has to have uh, a total hip replacement, but I would suggest that uh, in, gen in general, it's a much, much easier thing to do, much more difficult to do this kind of an osteotomy in that patient population. So the ideal implant for sure is the 120 degree fixed angle blade plate. Um, you can use other devices, and I'm gonna take you through a little bit of an exercise right now where we use the 95 degree. It is possible if you have large cavitary defects in the femoral head, you may choose a lower angle plate in order to get the blade into a lower position on the femoral head. Now, how, how do we do this? 
you saw some really good planning from Keith and Raul last week, but that's not really the how, that's the how to plan. Uh, but there's a lot to know after that, what to do. And I'm gonna take you through those, through those uh, stages right now. So this is, I still like to draw things out personally. It teaches me a lot about the osteology and over the course of my career, I think it's been very valuable for me to trace bones and to look at them critically and try to understand them. Uh, so this is the abnormal and normal overlaying each other. And I can see that I have a pretty, if I just wanna swing that femur of the abnormal one back to where the normal one is, that's gonna be the level of my correction right there. So we're talking about 25 degrees. And if I overlap these, Prox or the distal parts and look at the proximal, I see what the deformity looks like and it gives me a little bit of an idea as to where I may want to put my wedge, right, when I want to start to do my correction. Because if you do your wedge someplace else other than where the deformity is, you're going to end up with a secondary compensatory deformity. So again, I know I have 25 degrees and I, as Keith mentioned last week, I can play around with this wedge and I can move it to wherever I want. I can take a small wedge out or I can take a very large wedge out and I can pretty much put it where I want depending on what the deformity or what the osteotomy demands. In this case there was a leg length discrepancy so I'm going to want a little bit smaller wedge taken out the size of the wedge not the angular correction of it but the size of the wedge so I'll just put a little bit out to the side and that's gonna allow me to get a little bit more height adjustment uh, in this particular patient. Now, you, maybe you don't need that, but in this case it does. So we'll take a smaller wedge out and then we'll finish the cut and that'll allow us to tilt this up, look at the uh, normal, put it over the top of the normal. Is this gonna correct the mechanical situation in this patient? Yeah, I think it does. So I'm pretty, pretty happy with the appearance of that. I think that'll give us a pretty normal looking proximal femur. And I can put my templates on there. In this case, the 95, you can use the 110 um, or the 120 or the 130, depending on what you want to do. And now we have my particular plan. And we translate this over to the abnormal. We figure out where that chisel path is going to be. That's all we really have to know is the size of the wedge and where the chisel path is. But that's not what you, that's not all that you have to know. You have to know more than that, most definitely because there's a bunch of stages that are gonna get you to where you want to be at the end, right? What do you do in the operating room? Most people I know are putting in a reference pin to start. Uh, the reference pin is normally a 90 degree pin that you put in, and then uh, that pin you use to guide the rest of your pins after that. So I would suggest the reference pin at first at 90 degrees to the cortex. Now everything we do is being referenced to the lateral cortex of the femur because that's what you have to guide yourself on. Then uh, the second pin that we're gonna need is we're gonna base it off of the reference pin, the 90 degree pin, is the second red line. We need a pin in the bone to guide us to make the long cut of our osteotomy. So this one you can measure off the lateral cortex of the femur, it's gonna be 70 degrees. And intraoperatively, you're going to have to know how to create that 70 degree. You can either have a sterile goniometer or you can use these wedges that they have on the kit itself uh, in the osteotomy kit to do this. We know that there's going to be a 20 degree difference between our reference pin and this pin. So we just need to somehow find a reference for 20 degrees. In that set, there are a bunch of uh, triangles that uh, have different angular corrections on them or angles on them. So if you look at the set, there's three triangles and there's a 20 degree, a 30 degree, a 40, a 50, a 60, a 70. They even have the big ones up to 110. So you just have to pick the angle that you want. If you have a small angle, you may choose to bisect it, put it on the pin like this and use it as a bisector. So in the center of that, um, that wedge, you can see a hole. If you put the reference pin right in the middle, bisect it, and that's gonna give you this, uh, this 20 degrees that you can, used to guide yourself for putting in that, uh, that reference pin. Then the next pin that you're gonna need is something to guide the shortcut, right? You have this smaller, shorter cut that you have to make. And that pin is gonna go in based at 25 degrees, right? You need 25 degrees off of this wedge. So we'll take the 50 degree angle, we'll bisect that one. That's gonna give us 25 degrees. And I can use this edge right here to guide the placement of this pin 
which is gonna guide my hand with my saw for that cut. So here we are, this is what we have now in our plan. We've got a 90 degree pin. We have a 70 degree pin that guides us for the bottom cut. We've got 25 degree wedge pin that's gonna guide us for the top cut. And then finally, the last thing we're gonna need is a pin that's gonna guide us for the placement of the chisel at the top. And we measured that off the lateral cortex of the femur as well, and that's 110 degrees. So you can use a sterile goniometer, and I highly recommend that you have a stainless steel sterile, sterile goniometer intraoperatively to, to place that pin. Now you wanna have these pins in a location that's good for you for making the cuts. You want them close enough to where your osteotomy is gonna be, but far enough away that they get, they're not in your way when you go to, go to work on either the chisel or when you go to make these cuts. Keith mentioned that he, uh, early on, you may wanna put these pins in a location that you can actually rest the saw blade on the pin and cut on the pin. But in general, I find that uh, the pins get in my way, so I tend to keep them a little bit out and just use my eye to guide, to guide the cuts. So now we have a few more things that we want to measure. We want to know where your chisel path is going to be, where you're going to start your chisel, and how you go from there. And it's sometimes worthwhile to measure the lateral cortex of the femur to know how big this is going to be. So 25 millimeters down from the top, 16 millimeter wedge is being taken out. And now you're ready for the operating room. Uh, these are some images that Brett Christ uh, let me borrow. And uh, you can do this operation either in a lateral position or a supine position. Honestly, I tend to prefer the supine position for myself, unless I'm doing some work on the femoral neck or I need better access, uh, either anterior or posteriorly, or I'm doing a trochanteric osteotomy. Uh, but frequently I'm doing this in the supine position just because I like to sometimes reference the other femur intraoperatively. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, he's doing a Gibson. The lower end of the Gibson really is the approach to the proximal femur, uh, where you split through the fascia. And then you, very importantly, you go around the backside of the vastus and cleanly dissect that off. Here you can see Brett is using a, a, an a, a elevator. And a very sharp elevator is one of the best dissecting tools for taking the fibers of the vastus lateralis off the, off the intermuscular septum and off the lateral border of the femur. And then what you're looking at here is the proximal femur, the lateral border of the femur. And you can see that the vastus has been taken off the, the vastus ridge here very cleanly. And you're not dissecting over the anterior aspect or the posterior aspect of the femur. And you don't need to clean off uh, the, the trochanteric region at all. So very nice dissection. When you go to put the pins in, I would suggest that the pins go in using this two millimeter drill bit. This two millimeter drill bits, um, it's really quite good. Uh, and it's better than putting the pins in uh, not under, uh, under direct power because the pins tend to bend as they go in. So I'll put it in with this and then just slide the pins in by hand. So again, start with the 90 degree reference pin put your, your second pin in. This one happens to be 70 degrees to guide the lower cut. Put your next pin in to guide the upper cut of your osteotomy. And then figure out where your blade plate chisel is gonna go and where the start point is for that and where, you are, where your cuts are gonna be. This is what you're really gonna be looking at in the operating room, right? It's really just the lateral cortex of the femur. And uh, you can, and I do sometimes trace out where the plate is gonna sit on the lateral cortex because occasionally you may wanna flex it or extend it a little bit, depending on how much deformity you have in it. In this case, I wanted to actually flex the femur just a little bit because I felt there was a little bit of an extension deformity uh, to it. Again, intraoperatively, you can make marks uh, 25 millimeters down for the start of your blade plate chisel, 16 millimeters on the lateral cortex. You can make little marks as to where you believe uh, your osteotomy is going to be. And I like to use a small, very sharp chisel to make these marks because usually a bovi tends to wear off as you're working in there. So uh, a small little score line using a, a sharp osteotome is, is very valuable. And uh, this is what you're looking at. So um, in hard bone, I think it's very valuable to use the 4.5 drill bit and then subsequently route this out. A lot of times in a little bit softer bone, I'll just use an osteotome to open that, that little rectangle of bone and I'll save that little bit of bone for subsequent bone grafting. Um, 
This is very important. Make certain that you create a very good chisel path before making any cuts. If you make the cuts first and you're trying to create a chisel path, you're gonna be extremely unhappy. Uh, so make the chisel path and make sure you back it out a little bit before you make any of the cuts. And there we have a little bit of flexion in, the, in it. Now, if you have a flashlight and a magnifying glass, you can see these little numbers on the side of the chisel and it'll tell your depth and you should know that before you do your surgery. That should be part of your plan, how deep you're gonna go. And again, make certain that you back it out a little bit before, uh, before you do your cuts. Then you have to make a couple of cuts. I tend to make the short cut first and then make the longer cut after that. Uh, you do have to come in and out a few times. S I suggest that you use very thin blades for this. I tend to use a 0.6, not even a full millimeter, about 0.6 millimeter blade. It's flexible, but it'll give you a really nice cut and then stop there and then make the long cut after that. Sometimes you have to actually rotate the femur a little bit in order to complete that cut. Now a little bit on offset compression, because Keith talked about offset compression. If anytime that you have a blade plate of a higher angle, say 110, 120, 130, you have to use offset compression to do this. And the way to do this is to have something that creates a gap here in the proximal part of the femur uh, where the plate sits off of the bone not in the distal aspect, aspect, but in the proximal aspect. Because you have an oblique osteotomy here that you wanna get compression on, and you wanna create a gap here where this yellow line is. So what you're gonna do is start down here by fixing the plate to the bone first with a clamp and then with a single cortex screw that's gonna give you a little bit of compression and some contact here at the osteotomy. You do have to have some initial contact. Then you're gonna be left with this situation where you're gonna compress and close down this gap right here. And what that does is as you tighten this screw, you're gonna push this proximal segment against this obliquity. And it's that pressure that's gonna cause the compression and leave you with a very, very solid and stable situation when it's done. And that technique's extremely important. It does vary a little bit from patient to patient and how soft their bone is, how hard their bone is. And you have to be careful about how big of a gap that you, that you leave when you put that plate on the proximal segment. So in summary, these would be the take home points. I think there's an extremely valuable surgical legacy that you should take advantage of when you, when you plan to do these operations, when you think about them. You want to attempt to restore anatomy to normal I want you to plan your steps very, very carefully. Learn from the people that have come before you. And, um, and I think this will work out exceedingly well for you. It's an extremely gratifying surgery to do. I did include in this uh, talk a few articles uh, that I referenced. One from Rene Marti, one from Sean Nork and, Nork and Beret, um, Keith Mayo with some preoperative planning. And then finally, there's this classic article on Mast, Mast and Gans that I think is, is worth having in your, in your library.